I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars, and this is the new Kia EV6. The EV6 is a radical vehicle for Kia. This car is the first model to sit on the brand's new eGMP dedicated electric vehicle platform that is shared with sister company Hyundai and luxury arm of the group Genesis. We've already seen eGMP here in Australia with the launch of the Hyundai Ioniq 5, which looks completely different to the EV6. But it isn't just design that's going to separate the vehicles that sit on eGMP. There are radical differences in how the powertrains are tuned, and particularly there are differences in how the ride and the handling are tuned. And the EV6 has been comprehensively tuned in terms of suspension right here in Australia that should make it probably the driver's car of the set on this platform. Kia have been given the latitude to make the EV6 really quite sporty, and that's what we're expecting when we get a drive of this car early next year. It's expected to be in dealerships in February. We don't know pricing yet. It's about to be signed off and we expect that to be announced in January of 2022. But there's plenty that we do know today about the Australian spec of the Kia EV6. And I'm gonna bring you into the fold in today's video. We'll do our usual thing in one of these walkarounds. We'll check out the interior of the new EV6, which is radically different. We'll have a look at the back seat and the boot in terms of the practicality. And then I'll lay out which powertrains are coming to Australia, which variants, what the battery size and range will be, and how much we think this EV is going to cost when it arrives to sit above the Nero in Kia's electrified lineup in this country. But before we make a start, make sure to hit subscribe down below the video. Jumping inside the cabin of the Kia EV6, it's a comfortable and attractive place to spend time. There are a lot of cues in here from the brand new Sportage midsize SUV, including this beautiful curved piece of glass up here on the dashboard that houses the two 12.3 inch screens that are likely to be standard across the range. The center screen is a touchscreen. It has dedicated EV functions. It's got maps, navigation, wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, still no wireless CarPlay or Android Auto uh, on any Hyundai, Kia or Genesis vehicle with factory navigation due to a uh, disagreement with one of the large technology companies that provides uh, CarPlay or Android Auto, uh, which is a bit of a shame, but it still works well. Really responsive screen, really snappy, bright, and also just a little matte coating on it so that it doesn't pick up as much sun and uh, become unreadable on a bright day. In front of the driver, you've got your Speedo, you've got your power gauge, you've got your range remaining, your trip computer, but you've also got your blind spot cameras. This particular GT line has the blind spot cameras, which we rate as the best blind spot monitoring system on the market. Not sure if they'll be standard on the base grade, which will sit below the GT line, rear wheel drive only base car on the EV6. The GT line that I'm sitting in can be had as a rear wheel drive or the more powerful dual motor all wheel drive. And then later, about a year later, the flagship GT will sit above this vehicle in the lineup here in Australia. But the GT line certainly feels pretty salubrious, if not luxurious. And Kia openly say this is not meant to be a luxury car. It's much more of a sports car than a luxury car in their view. Um, I mean, this particular one has 239 kilowatts of power, which is pretty peppy. But in terms of, you know, being styled like a sports car inside, the seats for one are pretty grippy. The bolsters are quite tall and the mix of materials is not lush, but it's quite nice. So there's artificial suede in the center, perforated, heated and cooled here in the GT line. And there's artificial leather on the outside. And in actual fact, the steering wheel is artificial leather too. This is a vegan interior on this particular EV6 GT line, and that will be standard. Um, so, you know, the, the materials are pretty good. There's sort of recycled PET bottle motifs up here on the dash, but definitely not kind of luxury grade. In terms of eGMP, the Genesis GV60 is the vehicle you'll want to buy if you want a properly lush premium interior. Now, what else have we got? We've got Kia's new steering wheel. That looks pretty cool. Nice metal inlay. Regen paddles uh, on the back. So you can have absolutely no regen through four modes and then onto iPedal, which is almost one pedal driving, but it won't come to a complete stop just by itself. You have to hold down the uh, max regen paddle if you want the car to come to a stop. So that is one difference to something like a Tesla Model Y, and you'll either like that or not. We do have memory seats on this car. 
uh, we have, uh, what do we have? 10 ways of electric adjustment in the seat, but we also have the relaxation mode in the seat, much like the Ionic 5, where it tips right back so that while you're charging this vehicle, you can meditate, relax, take a little nap quite easily in this quite comfortable seat. The floor sits higher than what you might expect from something like a Stinger, um, which is kind of similar proportionally to this vehicle. That's because we're sitting on top of a large 77.4 kilowatt hour usable battery. But when you're in the driver's seat with the under thigh support here, also the passenger seat has the full electric adjustment too. Um, that doesn't really matter. I think you'll see in the back, the high floor starts to impinge comfort a little bit there, but up here, it's no big deal. The speaker system is actually by Meridian in this car, much like a Jaguar or Land Rover product. Typically Meridian speakers sound really good, so looking forward to coming back to you on that later. As you start to move down the belt line and below this cool floating center console, the material qualities start to get a little bit scratchy and hard. This is a late stage pre-production vehicle, so some of that might change, but I was told this is pretty reminiscent of what the actual interior will be like on the genuine item. In terms of practicality, huge space here under the seat, completely open, feels really futuristic. Uh, we have a center armrest here, deep, deep, deep bin, two cup holders, vented wireless charging, and we got a bunch of USB ports, five USB ports for the car, uh, plus a household PowerPoint with a vehicle to load function in the back, which is cool. In terms of a sunroof, we actually just have a little porthole sunroof here, not a full length uh, panoramic roof on this car. Uh, which is kind of interesting, but the view out looks pretty good. The mirror is a medium size. I can see out the back okay, but I'll save all that stuff for my driving impressions at a later date. In terms of what we don't know, we don't really know what the interior of the base car is gonna be like for Australia yet, nor do we know what the GT will really be like inside yet, but this is how the GT line is going to present. And by the way, this is the only interior color. There is a cream interior in the room that I'm sitting in now, but that's not coming to Australia, sadly. In the second row of the Kia EV6, the first impression you get is one of space. It's so open back here. The huge wheelbase of this vehicle just creates so much legroom, it isn't even funny. Like, with that seat set up in my own driving position, I'm six foot. You can see the leg room I've got is just absolutely massive. Headroom is not too bad either, despite the fact this car has quite a sporty roof line from the outside, um, but tow room is poor. Now I have the driver's seat as low as it will go. That's the way I always have it. It's the way you should have it if you can, but that means that the rear passenger in the EV6 doesn't have any tow room. Again, it's because we're sitting on the battery pack of the vehicle. That means that if you wanna have this sort of sexy low car like the EV6 is, not an ungainly, ugly looking sort of SUV blob thing. It means that ultimately you've got to compromise somewhere. If you're going to have a big skateboard battery, the floor is going to be higher, the roof is sort of lower, all of a sudden you've got, um, you know, a high floor, so your, your legs have got to go somewhere. You can see my legs are sort of floating a bit. Now Kia have actually put in the work to try and make it comfortable despite that. So the um, angle of the back seat is really inclined, much more inclined than it normally is. So you're still getting this support under your thigh. I think it's mainly worked, but it's not the most comfortable car I've sat in the rear of because yeah, ultimately your knees are still kind of flapping around a little bit here. They're not quite around your ears, but I think you get what I'm talking about. One benefit is though, you do get a flat floor here in the back. So the third person sitting in the middle doesn't feel that short changed. It's definitely not a bad middle seat. Now we've got USB-C ports built into the back of both front seats. We've got the coat hanger motif that we first saw on the Sportage earlier this year. Also, so you can hang a jacket here or whatnot. We've got a map pocket in the back of both seats, but they are covered in, in hard plastic. And I asked whether that might be something that will change for the production car, but I, it, I don't think it will actually. I think this is it. But still having the storage is good. Air vents are on the B pillars and then yep, hard plastic on the top of the doors here. Um, in terms of the window, the aperture does start to narrow a bit towards the back of the car, but the view out is still acceptable. I will point out though that with the GT line, with this black headliner, it does feel quite dark in the cabin. I am sitting in a dark room, so I'll wait until I actually have one out in the natural light to make a final comment on that. Uh, in terms of other features we have back here, we have the household PowerPoint um, down under the seat, and we have a flip down armrest with two and a half cup holders plus the rear seat 
uh, can be really upright and uncomfortable to maximize boot space, or it can actually be very reclined, which should make this car quite a comfortable companion on a long distance road trip. Moving around now to the back of the new Kia EV6, I think it's fair to say that this model really doesn't look anything like another vehicle in Kia's lineup. It's clearly intended as a new flagship for the brand, something to drive Kia forward into the next decade. And it kind of really does tap into the potential of running on a dedicated EV platform. So the wheels are really pushed out to the corners on this car. It's got a really long wheelbase. And as such, the form is really quite elegant, I think. Now, I will you know, say a word about design. It's always subjective and, and you know, however you feel about the way a car looks is completely up to you. But personally, I like it. This one this is a GT line. It's finished in this matte gray color, which is absolutely a statement. Although there is a navy blue car sitting here as well, which is really elegant. And it actually comes off looking quite different uh, to this matte gray. So there will be a number of options letting you choose something that you really like. Now, being a GT line, I've mentioned that it comes on 20 inch wheels, continental rubber, that all sets it off really nicely. I think there is a potential that the base car on the 19s might, might look a little bit under wheeled in terms of size, but I'll wait until I actually see one in order to you know, firmly say that. Unfortunately, the uh, need for speed underground green lighting under the car is uh, aftermarket. Uh, but you know, otherwise I think it's a really beautiful looking vehicle. And one small thing is the, the typography really takes a step up. Kia launched their new brand mark uh, a few months ago. That's obviously present on the car, but it's even on the EV6 badge and really subtle difference, a new GT line format uh, of that badge on the car. It all just feels subtly leveled up. Um, you know, it's a bit of a premium push for sure. This car will sit, you know, at the top of the Kia range when it launches. Um, but I think it really feels that way from a design perspective. The proportions don't easily come across on camera, I don't think. In the flesh, it actually reminds me more of a sort of a raised wagon, like an Audi All Road or a Volvo Cross Country than it does of uh, an SUV. And I think that's a good thing. This sort of long, low roof is a very elegant proportion. I think it suits the car. Now, we have a power tailgate. You see just a little animation there of the indicators, which uh, sort of blend into this kind of chrome finisher. It looks very cool. And also the indicators are not in the bumper. I know that's something that a number of people have pointed out in the comments that they don't like. In the EV6, they sit here in the main light cluster. Big thumbs up from me. Now, with the power tailgate open, height adjustable, we see the boot space. Up to 520 litres is what Kia Australia are saying. It's definitely not the biggest boot I've seen, but it does go back quite some way. It's actually the limitation of this sort of swooping coupe-esque roof line, which is gonna hinder practicality the most back here. Um, but we know Kia have more boxy, pragmatic shaped EVs in the works. The EV9 concept that was shown at this year's LA Auto Show looked absolutely fantastic. Something quite different to the EV6. But as I say, it's quite long, it's quite square. We have remote releases to drop down the rear seat backs. We have a cargo blind here to uh, give your stuff a bit of privacy. But what we don't have underneath the boot floor is a spare, which is quite interesting because spare wheels have been a sacred cow for Kia Australia for so long. You do get a tire mobility kit, but even in the uh, base model rear drive, which has 19 inch wheels, even that car doesn't even have a space saver, just the tire repair kit. And the EV6 becomes only the second car in uh, Kia's current range alongside the Nero EV and PHEV to not have any kind of spare wheel. And I think that just goes to where EVs are at currently. The packaging is coming along in leaps and bounds, but it's not quite there yet in terms of the size of the motors in order to package in uh, something like a spare on this car, which is definitely something to keep in mind if you do a lot of country touring. We also have this really nice aluminium finisher down here as a bit of a paintwork protection thing, and it also just looks good. And that takes me over to the other big feature around the rear end of the car, and that is the charge door. This one is pre-production, so it requires a good old press, uh, but the final finished cars will be a little bit better aligned. But that pops open electronically, uh, and it reveals the combination charging port here. Uh, being on the eGMP platform, like other vehicles on this architecture, it is a Type 2 CCS port, uh, where you can just remove this lower piece to reveal um, 
the combination port for DC fast charging. And the real party piece of this car is the 350 kilowatt ultra rapid charging capability, which along with the Ionic 5, this is the fastest charging EV in Australia. And at 350 kilowatts, if you can find one of those charges, there's one next to our office, which is, you know, very handy, uh, then you can actually jam 80% of the range back into this vehicle in just 18 minutes, which for an EV is super fast. And while it may not be as quick as refueling a petrol car or a diesel car before you, you know, abuse me in the comments for that point, I am completely with you. And I do think that charging needs to get faster and faster the point is, is that we're absolutely on that road and this car becomes genuinely usable for long distance country road trips in this country with this kind of really fast charging speed. And that's recharging a 77.4 kilowatt hour battery, which gives you up to 528 kilometers of range, WLTP, for the rear wheel drive vehicle. So suddenly in a big country like Australia, something like the EV6 starts to feel quite usable in my opinion. And on that note, uh, let's go to the front of the car and we'll have a look under the bonnet at the front boot. And then I'll lay out the powertrains, the choices, and some of the expected pricing for Australia. Having had a look at the boot space of this vehicle, the next thing I'm gonna do is show you the frunk or the fruit or the whatever the cargo space at the front of the car is called. And then I'm gonna lay out which powertrain options are going to come to Australia and when, and how much I think they're gonna cost. Now, opening the fruit is via a sort of traditional latch for a bonnet, but then it's on nice heavy duty assisted struts there, so you don't really have to do anything. And that opens up to reveal a sort of front space here that is at first remarkably familiar to combustion motoring, which is sort of unusual for a dedicated EV platform. Um, in something like a Tesla Model 3 or a Porsche Taycan, this is really featureless and just has some front storage. Here in the Kia EV6, and on other vehicles on eGMP. It sort of looks like it is a combustion platform, but it very much is not. This is a dedicated architecture for EVs. It even says EV. Now, we open up the fruit with another latch, and that opens to reveal just 20 litres of space if you go for the dual motor all wheel drive, like this particular car is. If you have the single motor rear wheel drive variant, you get a 52 litre frunk. Either way, neither of them will fit a um, carry on suitcase in the same way a Porsche Taycan will, and the Teslas go even further again. So, this is one area where packaging probably could have, should have, would have been better. Um, but in terms of compromises, being made on these cars, I'd probably prefer it was here um, than somewhere fundamental. You can let me know your opinion in the comments section below. But that neatly brings me on to what is sitting underneath uh, the fruit and limiting the amount of space. And that is the second front motor on this particular vehicle because what I'm standing next to is indicative of a GT line all wheel drive. And effectively this will sit sort of at the upper end of the EV6 range here in Australia. The company has confirmed to me today that they'll be bringing in a base model with rear wheel drive, a GT line with rear wheel drive or all wheel drive, and then later the full fat Kia EV6 GT, which will be not just the top of the range for the EV6, but also very much the halo car for Kia as a whole at this point in time. So. What does that mean and when are those different variants coming? So everything but the GT is coming in February 2022, pending any final delays, but it's currently you know, early December. So February is right around the corner on the other side of the summer holidays. So that's certainly encouraging. There's only one battery coming to Australia at this point in time, and that's the 77.4 kilowatt hour usable battery known as the long range overseas. Kia Australia say they will homologate the shorter range battery, but there's no immediate plan to put it into a car for Australia. I wouldn't be surprised if it was some kind of price leading rear wheel drive shorter range variant further down the track, particularly if uh, all of these other versions are sellouts as they are expected to be at least for the first year. Now the rear wheel drive single motor versions have just that, a single motor on the rear axle of the vehicle producing 168 kilowatts of power and 350 newton meters of torque. And unlike something like the Nero EV, which is a combustion platform with front wheel drive single motor, the EV6 is rear wheel drive. So something of a pure special, much more akin to a Stinger than any other Kia currently on the market. From there, it's a step to the rear wheel drive GT line, uh, which 
is sportier, looks sportier, has bigger wheels, 20 inch wheels compared to 19 inch wheels on the base model. It opens up stuff like this beautiful matte gray paint on this particular car. But the main thing the all-wheel drive adds is a second motor. So it is actually all-wheel drive as opposed to a front engine and a transaxle uh, like you get in a combustion vehicle. Um, so that's very cool. And that means that the all-wheel drive version makes quite a bit more power, 239 kilowatts of power and 605 newton meters of torque. And that's enough to give it a zero to 100 time in the five second range. So really quite quick uh, for a Kia very much approaching the Stinger GT sort of level, which is currently the most powerful vehicle in the Kia lineup. But then the Stinger will get blown away at the end of 2022 or potentially very early 2023 with the arrival of the EV6 GT. Now that currently uses the same 77.4 kilowatt hour usable battery. Uh, it has all drive dual motor, but it steps up the outputs to 430 kilowatts of power and 700 newton meters of torque. And it can do zero to 100, Kia says, in three and a half seconds. So it should completely move the game on in terms of the sort of performance level that a Kia has ever been able to achieve. That car will get a separate suspension configuration. There's already two tunes of suspension that have been done right here in Australia. One for the rear wheel drive variant and one for the all wheel drive variant, which adds about 40 kilograms over the front wheels that isn't present in perhaps the purest special, which is the rear wheel drive. And at this point, I think it's probably prudent to throw to Graham Gambold, who did the suspension tune right here in Australia for the EV6, to give a few comments on the sort of thing that Kia was going for in terms of suspension feel. But let's hear exactly what it was that Kia were looking for from the suspension of this car. Even though they've got a low center of gravity, personally, as a chassis dynamicist, I think the biggest Part of that is the width of the battery in the car. So typically a car has uh, an engine and a drivetrain that's got a high centre of gravity, but it's all in the centre of a car and therefore it works like a moment in roll. But this car's got a big flat battery in it. So it's got to lift the energy on the inside to actually upset the car. So the car's got a very flat roll dynamic. Um, and the weight, yes, it, it, it feels a little bit heavy, but it doesn't drive like a heavy car. It actually drives like a really light, nimble, pointable, direction change, race car almost. It's, it's fantastic, it's so enjoyable to drive. There's a lot of fundamental changes to the chassis dynamics, um, both kinematic changes and actual dynamic performance changes that we have to sort of factor into our tuning design and our tuning models. Um, that became a bit of a challenge because we hadn't had a lot of experience to the new platform Prior to, uh, prior to the car arriving and we couldn't go to Korea to experience it and tune it and familiarise ourselves with it. So we did a lot of work on paper um, with, with data sent down from Korea, giving us all the new dimensions. And like you say, centre of gravity height is a big factor. But when we drove the car, I actually thought that even though the computer models had changed quite a bit, the car's dynamic wasn't as uh, aggressively changed, if you like. So we then set about a process of uh, tuning it, having driven European and domestic specification dampers and got a, got a feel for the car and then tuned our damper requirement around that. So this is uh, the rear shock absorber out of the EV6. It looks conventional, looks no different to any other shock absorber that we put in our cars, except it's... Uh, made by ZF Sachs and it's a frequency selective damper as opposed to a piston speed selective damper. So what that means is when we're running down a country road that requires a lot of body control with big undulations and you know, a bouncing sort of road, the damper generates a lot of energy and controls that body motion and the weight of the car. But when we're going over an urban patched road or a little bit of a jiggly surface or a busy road surface, the damper reduces its damping and just soaks it up. So uh, it's a really fantastic technology. It has been around for a few years now in various European models and, and manufacturers, but uh, this is our first experience to use it and the result speaks for itself. I mean, the car's got a very nice, compliant, round feeling, but really great body control. 
So all of these specifications for the EV6 look pretty promising on paper. And from our experience with the Hyundai Ioniq 5 out on the road, there's also a lot to be said for the platform and the powertrains that this vehicle uses. So I'm certainly feeling pretty good about having a first drive of this car next year. But what is the EV6 going to cost you? Well, we won't definitively know final pricing for probably another six weeks from the day that I'm talking to you, which is early December here in uh, my reality. But we do know a few ideas of uh, how much this car is going to cost. Now, we know that Kia globally have benchmarked the pricing of the Tesla Model Y uh, for how much the EV6 costs. Now, the Model Y also doesn't have a price for Australia, but we're predicting that vehicle will cost about sixty. $6,000 for an entry level variant when it does eventually have a price tag put on it. We know that Kia internally also look at the Ionic 5 in terms of where to position this car. And the Hyundai is 71,990 for the rear wheel drive with the same long range battery as this car, actually one less module in that battery. And it's $75,990 for the all wheel drive version. Now the EV6 is actually pitched as a little bit more sporty, a little bit more technologically advanced, a little bit more powerful than the Ionic 5. So if I was a betting man, I would say that the GT line in rear wheel drive will be low 70s and the GT line with all wheel drive will be somewhere between $75,000 and $80,000. So a little bit higher than the Ionic 5 here in Australia. But the Kia has a base model that Hyundai currently does not in the Ionic 5. And I reckon that car is gonna scrape into the upper $60,000 range to be a direct rival to the Model Y, but also just to get that six onto the price tag of this vehicle. Of course, that creates a whole host of other problems about where the Nero EV is supposed to sit, which is currently around that kind of price. The second generation Nero is on its way to Australia as well, which will be an entry level full EV when it gets here. Of course, this is all speculation. Who knows, in eight weeks time, we might look back and I was wrong, but I think that that's probably very much the ballpark of where it will land. As for where to go from here, there's only gonna be 500 EV6s coming to Australia in 2022, unless a further allocation is secured. So if you think you want one of these vehicles, you should run, not walk to your Kia dealership and demand you get put on the list because these things are gonna sell out. There's been 16,000 expressions of interest. So that means there's 30 people for every single EV6 that will be available. Well, those are my first impressions of the car. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. While you're there, make sure to hit subscribe and the notification bell. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.